a new way to view the enterprise tech market, 25 years of lessons in the cloud SaaS ERP space, and surviving the soap opera of SAP implementations. Those are just a few of the topics we're going to cover here today in episode number 146 of Transformation Ground Control. This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 146. My name is Eric Kimberling. This is the podcast that has everything to do with digital transformation, including the strategy, people, process, and technology aspects of transformation. This show is produced by Major Tom Productions and sponsored by Third Stage Consulting. Um, Third Stage Consulting, not coincidentally, is the company that I am the uh, CEO of and the founder of, so glad to be here with you today. Uh, if you're interested in sponsoring the show or having your brand exposed on the show, please feel free to reach out to contact at majortom-productions.com. Again, that's contact at majortom-productions.com. We've got a great episode for you here today, and uh, we're going to share some really interesting insights today. We're going to open up with some questions from the audience, and we're going to get to that uh, Q&A session here to open up the segment. And in the opening segment, we'll also talk about some of the uh, hot topics we have in store for you here today. Two in particular, one is a simplified view or a new way to view the enterprise technology space. So really getting outside the box or thinking outside the box of the way we typically think about enterprise technology applications and rethinking how we approach IT in general and enterprise-wide technologies in general as well. So we'll talk a bit about that based on a recent CIO article. And we'll also get into uh, top signs that your organization would benefit from a new ERP system. And this is based on an article from uh, Supply and Demand executive or supply and demand chain executive uh, magazine. They've got some good signs that you should be looking for um, to determine whether or not an ERP system might be beneficial to your organization. So we'll cover that here today in our hot topics as well. And then later, I'm excited for our first guest. He's a first time guest on the show and uh, really a pioneer in the SaaS and the cloud enterprise technology space. Um, In fact, uh, he is the founder of the organization that was the first SaaS cloud based ERP solution, and that is NetSuite. So Evan Goldberg, who is the founder of NetSuite and now Senior Vice President of NetSuite at Oracle, since Oracle acquired NetSuite, um, he will be on the show. We're going to talk today about just his lessons over the last 25 years of being a pioneer in the cloud ERP space, but also looking to the future of where he sees cloud and SaaS solutions going in the future, not just for NetSuite, but for the enterprise tech space in general. So really excited to have him on the show. Stay tuned for that. And then later in the show, we'll have Kyler Cheatham and Wayne Holtham, both from the Third Stage Consulting team. They're going to be on the show talking about the soap opera that is an SAP implementation. And actually, it's not just SAP implementations in particular, although we are going to dive into SAP-specific implementations. Some of those lessons that we'll get to later today are actually relevant to any sort of ERP implementation or digital transformation. So be sure to stick around for that. It should be a a great uh, conversation as well. So just getting started here on some of the uh, questions from our audience. We Each week in this podcast, we pull some of the top questions or some of the most interesting questions and comments that we get on our social media channels. So if you're not following me already, be sure to follow me on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, You can follow me there, comment on any of the uh, content I put out there, and we'll keep an eye on those um, platforms to pull different questions uh, that we find interesting that might be worth talking about here. So be sure to drop those uh, in any of the social platforms, or if you've got a question you want us to cover or a topic you want us to cover, just drop it in the chat of wherever you're listening or watching to this uh, to this podcast episode. So the first uh, comment we have is actually from uh, a LinkedIn post I had uh, several days ago. It was a post about customization. Is it is it a necessary evil or is it a good thing? Um, and it's sort of a loaded question. Most people argue, I would say, that it's a bad thing, that you definitely, you generally don't want to customize. 
but in this video and in, in this post, I really dive into the sort of the pros and cons because there's never a black and white, easy answer to any of these decisions. And uh, not customizing software, of course, is always easier said than done. It's easy to say that from an ivory tower, but very difficult to do in reality. Um, not just because organizations have trouble changing, but because um, a lot of times and most of the time, a software application or any sort of solution is not going to be a perfect fit for what your needs are. And so then you're stuck with the question of, do we change the business to fit to the software? Or do we change the software to fit the business? And of course, you might come to different conclusions based on how important that business process is or how important that need is to the organization. So that was the context or the background behind this particular post. And the comment that we had on this post that, that's worth diving into is change business processes to adopt good practices and as built rather than pandering to that's the way we have done it here. It is more accessible to change how you do things rather than how things are designed to work. Seems like a lost cause. So this person is, uh, of course, advocating for using software good practices. And I like how this person, first of all, does not call it best practices because that's not only because it's a trigger for me uh, personally, but also because I, they just don't exist. There is no such thing as best practices. So I, I really like that this person is referring to good practices. And that's that's really a good way to, to view it too. I had never used that term, but I think it's something I might borrow from this person because I think it's a it's a, it's a good way to manage expectations and the realities of what you're getting with off-the-shelf software. Good practices might be better than what you've got. It may not be better than what you've got, too. That's the other thing that uh, software vendors often don't um, point out. But uh, point being that this person is saying, you know, use, this, use these good practices, use the software as built rather than pandering to the way it's always been. And I think that's a really good – it's a good point on one side. I think it makes one solid argument on – case for just using software off the shelf and, and not customizing the software. But what I think it overlooks, though, is is the part about that's the way we've always done it here. And of course, there's there's a underlying current, a current of resistance to change within that whenever someone refers to how we've always done things or the way things have always been within an organization. Oftentimes, that's a sign of resistance. But there's other times where there's some relevance to the comment. And that's where this gets tricky is because Sometimes it's flat out resistance to change. We just don't want to change. That's the way we've always done things. So why would we change and why would we use the way the software is built? That's sort of the, the resistance to change line of thinking. Now, the other line of thinking is we have core competencies. We have core competitive advantages that we don't want to lose. And we're not going to water down or dilute those competitive advantages simply because the software has their own good practices that are not as good as what we've built internally. And I think that's what a lot of organizations don't realize or forget or underestimate is that they probably have some very strong competitive advantages that they've built over the years. And they've probably created some custom applications or custom manual processes or whatever it is that might be ugly, might not be pretty, but they are competitive advantages and they give you some sort of unique differentiator in the marketplace. Those are the cases where you do want to customize. And that's different than if I'm an AP clerk and I just don't like the way a software is set up to, you know, set up certain fields within, you know, a, a invoice processing or whatever. That would be a resistance to change. That would be something where you'd say, okay, Eric, you know, you're an AP clerk. This software has good enough AP practices or best or good practices, I should say. So that in that case, that might be a situation where you would leverage or defer to the way the software is built. But when it's your business processes related to the way you service your customers or the way you build a product or something that's unique to you as an organization, it gives you a leg up over your competitors. That would be a case where you say, yes, we've always done things a certain way, and there's a reason why we've done it that way, and there's a, a, a value to that. So that's where it gets tricky to where you say, okay, now we've got to decide, do we, do we customize the software to get it to do what we need it to do to maintain that competitive advantage? Or perhaps we look at a third-party bolt-on system, and that's another good workaround is to say, let's go find a solution that can do exactly what we need it to do. Um, and then of course, if you need to, customization is not a terrible thing, especially if you're operating in a private cloud or an on-premise uh, type of solution that makes it a lot easier to, to customize. There is risk involved. There's cost, there's additional resources. It creates problems with the upgrades later on, potentially if you don't address those upgrades or if you don't address and, and update those customizations. 
but those are the things you've got to think through and it's not the end of the world if you do some customization so i think it's uh it's hard to think of this as a as a purely black and white decision point every organization is going to have a different mix of customization needs or acceptable customization needs but i think the key is to be objective about it and not get too cornered in a box um, because you just don't want to customize or because the industry is telling you not to customize um, on the flip side you do have to watch the slippery slope of customization which is what are the big challenges that that organizations have and that once you start to customize once you realize you can customize the software it becomes really easy to continue to customize beyond what you should be doing so you have to have really solid project governance in place to make sure that you address that but uh, when you're strategic and targeted and selective about when you customize it's not the end of the world and and i think there are cases where where you can do that and have it make sense so great question there thank you for that comment on linkedin and then another comment here this one's actually from a youtube video i posted probably a year or two ago but the comments continue to come in on this video it's just a video about what is artificial intelligence and machine learning and uh, it's meant to be sort of an introduction to machine learning and AI, um, which is obviously a lot of, there's a lot of buzz around that. In fact, I know we're going to talk about it here later today uh, with Evan from NetSuite. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, we'll dive into AI uh, based on some of the questions I have for him. Um, but here in this comment on YouTube, this person said, one question I have about AI and machine learning, especially regarding ERP and business processes, is how do we ensure the quality of results? So this is an interesting question. I wasn't 100% sure in this question if it's related to the implementation of ERP and new business processes or if it's using AI to enhance ERP and business processes. So I'll sort of ad- try to address both um, as, as a way to, to address a couple different angles here. Um, one is let's start with the implementation. I mean, AI is something you can use, um, and we're seeing more organizations use for implementation. So you, you can use AI, for example, for data cleansing. Um, AI is a good potential tool to help with data cleansing, data mapping, things of that nature, getting rid of duplicate data, um, inconsistent data, things like that. Um, that's becoming increasingly important. Of course, with AI, you've got to have better data. So that's a, sort of a um, full circle sort of a thing. If you're using AI, you can use that to improve your data, which enhances your ability to use AI within the ERP system because you have better data. Um, which leads me to the, I guess, the other angle, which is how do you use AI within an ERP system within your business processes? And as we'll talk about here again later today, uh, when we have our first guest on with Evan from from NetSuite, AI is a big deal. And and for uh, NetSuite, who's who he represents, other software vendors in the marketplace, they're all focused pretty heavily on AI. Whether it's trying to figure out a way to integrate their interface with the Open AI platform and other. AI sources, or whether it's building their own AI tools to help analyze and and create more meaning and insights behind some of the data that organizations are capturing. But I think one of the big things here is that, um, you know, organizations now have the ability with AI, whether it's open AI platforms or AI tools embedded within your ERP system, there's a lot of great opportunities now to use AI, but it's not going to benefit your business just because it's in the software. You have to figure out a way to use it and deploy it organizationally and operationally, not just technologically, not just technologically, but also operationally and organizationally. How do you get people to actually use AI and use the AI tool sets? And that's a totally different thing. And that's, an, that's the hard part is it's easy to deploy the technology that has AI capabilities, but how do you get people to use it? How do you get the business value out of it? I think that's where we're really going to see organizations struggle here in the next few years is the the magnitude and the strengths and the power of these tools is so great that it's almost too much for a lot of organizations to really adapt to quickly. And it's almost too much for individuals within the organizations to adapt to quickly. So we have to create and articulate a clear vision of what those processes are going to look like, how we're going to use AI throughout the organization, how it's going to be baked into our processes. And ultimately, we have to build our training and our business processes, our organizational design, roles and responsibilities. We have to build everything around the use of these AI tools in order for organizations to get the full value out of it. And if we don't, we're going to have the shelfware just sitting there, AI capabilities, AI tools. We can say we have AI, but we're not getting business value out of it. People aren't using it the way it should. Um, I think um, we'll talk about this more with Evan here later in the show because uh, I, I want to hear his perspective. But what I think you're seeing is is – 
software vendors are also working on getting AI to be more sort of behind the scenes. So it's not putting as much of a burden on humans to know how to use AI or know how to know how and when to leverage AI tools. So in other words, being able to provide, um, I'll, I'll use an example of demand forecasting. So if, if I'm forecasting demand for my product so I can manufacture the right amount at the right time and have it to my customers at the right time, all that stuff, um, that's prone to human error and, and uh, misanalysis and misdiagnosis of data if we're, if we're relying on humans to analyze that data. But if there's AI tools running in the background that give you a forecast of what the demand forecast will likely be based on the data you have and external data as well, that's an example of where it's not imposing a new process per se. It's just giving me a new data set to look at and work from in my job. But I still have to be, I still have to define my job and my roles and responsibilities in my business process to leverage that data. Um, but I think software vendors are trying to make AI a little bit more uh, seamless, seamlessly integrated with the software, if you will. Um, that's the vision, at least, or that's the direction they seem to be going. They're not all there yet. There's still obviously a work in progress because this is a relatively new technology. Um, that's just now getting mainstream adoption within the enterprise tech space. So um, great question there about AI and machine learning. It's obviously something we're going to continue to talk about a lot on this podcast and something that will be covered um, and discussed often uh, in the industry as well. So those are a couple of the great hot topics we have to start with here today. I appreciate uh, the feedback everyone has. If you have comments or questions you'd like to ask on this show or you'd like us to address on the show, just drop them in the chat if you're if you're watching this um, wherever you're watching the stream, uh, drop in the chat. Or if you're listening on the audio podcast, you can uh, you can uh, message me on social media as well. So uh, we're going to shift gears and come back to some hot topics here in just a moment. Uh, we're going to talk about a new way to view the enterprise tech space and the enterprise technology market, and then we're also going to talk about some of the signs to look for to indicate that your business might benefit from ERP software. So. Be sure to stick around for that. We're going to cover that here in just a moment after a break. And then later, after we get to these hot topics, we're going to have Evan Goldberg, the founder of NetSuite, will be on this podcast, which I'm excited for. So uh, stay tuned for that. We're going to talk about uh, his sort of lessons learned over the last 25 years of the cloud ERP space, as well as where the cloud ERP and SaaS ERP enterprise tech space is headed in the future. So rare opportunity to get to meet and chat with one of the uh, if not the pioneer of the SaaS and cloud ERP space um, with Evan Goldberg from NetSuite. And then later in the show, we'll have Wayne Holtham and Kyler Cheatham on the show to talk about the soap opera of, e of SAP ERP implementation. So be sure to stick around for that. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. Could you whisper in my ear the things you want to feel? I'll give you anything. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience, and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Well, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 146. My name is Eric Kimberling, your host here today. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting, and Third Stage Consulting is an independent and technology agnostic digital transformation consulting firm and also the sponsor of this podcast. Uh, the podcast is produced by Major Tom Productions. You can learn more about sponsorship opportunities on this podcast by going to majortom-productions.com. You can just spell out the word Major Tom. Um, like the David Bowie song. Yes, it is named after David Bowie, uh, majortom-productions.com. Uh, you can learn more about what that company does and some of the media and sponsorship opportunities within the enterprise technology space there. So be sure to check that out as well. So excited for uh, some hot topics here, some really interesting articles and news and, and analysis that have recently hit the press, uh, one of which is a simplified view of the enterprise technology market, which is a article that was recently published earlier this month in CIO Magazine. 
And it's really interesting because it, it's written by an industry analyst, but it's an industry analyst who's worked in the enterprise tech space that's sort of not really criticizing, but, but challenging the way industry analysts typically think about enterprise technology. And therefore, what he's saying is that the way industry analysts view enterprise technology in this flawed sort of a way is undermining IT leaders and their ability to be able to make good decisions and to view IT the way they need to within their organizations. And the general gist of the article is interesting because it talks about how, um, generally speaking, industry analysts like to break up the enterprise technology space into little buckets. And, and sometimes I'm guilty of this as well in some of my content. I'll, I'll pull out a little uh, fragment or a niche within the enterprise tech space, and I'll talk about you know what the best solutions are within that little niche or how different systems compare within that little little niche. And he's basically saying that that's a faulty way of thinking about enterprise tech, which I, I tend to agree with. If, if that's the only thing you do is look at IT and enterprise technologies in silos, you're not really looking at the whole big picture and the full integrated end-to-end -end use of new technologies and new business processes. And so the question becomes, well, then how do you how do you think differently? How do you think about the enterprise tech space if you're not going to break things up into ERP systems and CRM and HR technology, supply chain solutions, business intelligence? You know, we have all these functional needs and capabilities that have specific solutions that focus on those needs and capabilities. But how do we assess technology if we're not doing it in the context of niches or, or functional needs within our with our business? And that's what this whole the the whole gist of this article is is it's sort of challenging the way we typically think about it, enterprise technology and looking at new ways of, of addressing those or, or or viewing enterprise technology. So some of the uh, f there's five sectors that he points out in his article that talks about you know the the categories of enterprise technology, if you will. One is business architecture and portfolio management. Another is data integration and intelligence. So really looking across applications, but focusing on that data integration and the whole business intelligence aspect of it. Um, IT observability and intelligence, process discovery, orchestration, and automation platforms. And I think that's where a lot of organizations sort of hone in is how do we find a technology within a functional area that can help us improve a business process within a certain functional area. But what he's saying in this article is that we should view business processes across different functions. Um, to look at ways to orchestrate and automate platforms across. So um, very interesting view uh, of things and just a, a very important slight nuance to the way we typically think about this stuff. And then finally, um, user experience management and adoption platforms. So looking at different technologies that help really provide that uh, gateway into ERP systems um, from a user or internal employee perspective. That's a, another category that he suggests here. And so it's really interesting because, um, you know, it's, it, it challenges us to really think about broader end-to-end -end categories of technology and finding applications and platforms and not really just focusing on your traditional legacy categorizations of enterprise technologies. And so I, I like uh, his thinking here, and I think it's a, it's a very interesting approach about how digital transformation becomes the platform and digital transformation, your internal digital transformation becomes more of a focus on a platform rather than an ERP solution or a specific uh, application. And uh, it really helps differentiate between the lines of business and the functional gaps versus the universal sort of control room technologies um, that, that sort of tie everything together. And, you know, one thing I think th there's a risk here, though, I guess you, to be aware of, you know, if we think about things in this broader sense is that now we might end up going down a rabbit hole unintentionally of looking at different best of breed solutions or focusing less on an application and focusing more on a platform that we deploy that allows us to potentially customize or create applications or find third party applications based on that platform. So it could potentially unintentionally create this sort of uh, best of breed siloed um, spaghetti bowl diagram of different systems that now you've got to figure out how to tie it all together and have it make sense and have it talk to one another. And then obviously, how do you manage a platform that requires a certain amount of IT depth and capabilities? So um, some interesting considerations there that um, they really need to, they are, are worth thinking about, but a very interesting perspective nonetheless, and that it's a, a different way and a different lens to view enterprise technologies than we have in the past. So interesting article from CIO Magazine. I think that was published on November 1st, uh, earlier this month. So be sure to check that out if you haven't already. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty good article. So 
Uh, appreciate that. Um, another good hot topic here today is top signs that your business would benefit from an ERP system. And this is from Supply and Demand Chain Executive. Uh, this article was also published earlier this month. Um, and this is an interesting article because it's written in the context of a supply chain manager or a supply chain management focus. Um, obviously, given the audience of this particular publication with Supply and Demand Chain Executive magazine. Um, but it really talks about the widespread uncertainty that are affecting various industries and how ERP systems can help with that. And so some of the market challenges that the article points out that, that we, we have to deal with and figure out how to use technology to help us deal with is uh, supply chain issues, labor shortages, inflation, uh, mismatch of uh, labor, uh, available labor force versus what's required um, to make the economy continue to grow. Um, talks about inflation being um, higher potentially um, to close out the year 2023. Um, it's, it's estimated to be, at least in the U.S., inflation is expected now to be twice as high as it was um, at the start of the year, uh, according to the, the Federal Reserve's projections. Um, so those are some of the challenges that organizations are facing. So then you start to think, okay, does that mean every organization needs an ERP system to help m manage or mitigate this risk? Or another way to look at it is how, how can ERP software help mitigate some of these challenges? And so some of the signs that the article talks about that you should look for that might suggest an ERP system could help is one is uh, any sort of industry and regulatory focus. So organizations that sell food, seafood, meat, cannabis, other highly regulated sorts of uh, um, products, ERP systems, especially cloud ERP systems that are continuously updating, uh, can provide better regulatory compliance and better visibility and, and quality requirements as too. So those are that's one sign is if you have uh, a sort of industry focus that requires a very strong regulatory compliance, uh, ERP systems can help with that. Um, workforce discrepancy. If, if you notice that there's a, a labor shortage um, and you're suffering from oversight and quality control issues, that's where ERP software can help as well. And ERP software has historically been pretty good at that. So that's another uh, thing to, to focus on as well. Um, uh, problems with tribal knowledge. So you have a lot of knowledge, a lot of uh, expertise and just knowledge of your business and understanding your business. Uh, but it's all in people's heads and not documented, not repeatable, not you know based in a in a, in a enterprise wide application that everyone has access to. Um, that's something where an ERP system can help take that siloed knowledge and that undoc undocumented knowledge and some of the manual processes that go along with that. It's a way to centralize that and create a, a more collective knowledge base versus a individual tribal based knowledge. Um, organizations that have trouble with supply chain visibility, which a lot of organizations do right now, that's another sign that ERP systems are another symptom that ERP systems can help with. And then adapting to change, you know, organizations that are struggling with change in general or aren't able to keep up uh, because they're outgrowing their, their systems and their processes and technologies aren't changing fast enough to allow them to keep up with changing market demands. Those are a few of the signs that if you have this trouble adapting to change, those, those are the symptoms that ERP systems can help with as well. So, of course, this article is not suggesting that ERP systems can solve everyone's problems and every single problem, but um, those are some of the symptoms and potential business benefits that a new ERP system can bring to the table. So, uh, interesting stuff and uh, always good to really think about, you know, if you are going down the path of a new ERP system, why is it you're going down that path? What is it you, you're trying to get out of the system? What kind of business value? do you expect to get? What kind of uh, um, risks are you trying to address? What kind of challenges are you trying to address within the organization? So uh, really good stuff there. So um, thank you for that article, whoever wrote it. I don't. I apologize, I don't have the author's name here, but that was from Supply and Demand Chain Executive Magazine. So good stuff. Um, we're going to shift gears here in a moment. They'll have our first guest on the show, which I'm really excited for. Uh, Evan Goldberg's going to be on to talk about um, 25 years in the cloud ERP space, as well as, more importantly, what does the future hold? Where are we headed with the cloud ERP space? That's going to be the, the next step after that. So we're looking forward to that conversation, and uh, we'll have him on here as soon as we take a quick break. But first, we'll take that break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. 
Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 146. My name is Eric Kimberling. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. You can also find it streaming to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as on audio podcast platforms throughout the world. But the easiest thing to do is to go to transformationgroundcontrol.com. And this podcast is produced by Major Tom Productions. You can learn more about Major Tom Productions at majortom-productions.com. And it's sponsored by Third Stage Consulting, which is the company that I am the CEO of. Um, so uh, excited for our next guest. He's a first-time guest on the show. Uh, he's a, definitely a pioneer in the enterprise technology space. Uh, he started his career at Oracle and uh, founded a company that you may have heard of called NetSuite, which uh, went on to become a very successful cloud ERP SaaS solution and has since been acquired by Oracle. So he left Oracle, started NetSuite, and then the company was acquired by Oracle uh, several years ago. I'm going to let him describe his background in more detail and, and do a better rendition of his own background than that. But that's a little bit about who he is. This is Evan Goldberg, and uh, he's the founder of, of the company NetSuite. And I thought it'd be great to have him on the show, not only because he leads a successful ERP software solution in the marketplace or in a software vendor in the marketplace, but also because he was one of the pioneers of cloud ERP and cloud and SaaS technology as we know it. Uh, back in 1998, when he started the company, this wasn't a, a thing. Cloud and SaaS was not a thing. It wasn't even a, there wasn't really a term for it. Um, it wasn't called the cloud back then. It was just delivering applications over the internet. And it was kind of a novelty idea or a, a new idea at the time. And uh, the, he built a whole company and a whole uh, niche in the market that has now become the main way that we know software today in the enterprise technology space. So I uh, thought it'd be great to have him on the show to talk about the last 25 years of cloud technologies and more importantly, where we're we headed in the future. So with all that being said, Evan, thank you for being here today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So to start, for those that maybe don't know a lot about you or about NetSuite, tell us a little bit about, about yourself and about NetSuite. Um, sure. So, uh, NetSuite is a business application for fast growing businesses, um, small and medium sized businesses, um, kind of giving you everything you need um, to manage and grow your business sort of all in one place. Um, that includes capabilities that have traditionally been called ERP, CRM, HCM, et cetera, those, all those TLAs. Um, but really, you know, it's about uh, helping you grow and transform your business, giving you the best information you uh, can get to uh, help, uh, help you grow and make great decisions. So that's what I do is run this organization at Oracle. Um, we started uh, as a startup 25 years ago. I founded it actually with Larry Ellison. So we were sort of always a, a cousin of Oracle. I joke that um, when we got back together with Oracle, it was like cousins marrying, but second cousins. Right. Um, and so, so yeah, so ran ran the company from you know a startup in a uh, small apartment above a hair salon uh, back in 1998. Built it um, to be a company that went public in uh, 2007, and we were acquired by Oracle in 2016. And over 25 years, we've helped tens of thousands of companies. We have 37 over 37,000 customers right now using NetSuite to help run their business and uh, achieve their their visions. Very cool. That's yeah, a cool, cool story. Um, now you were you, you mentioned that you started the company with with Larry Ellison. You were at Oracle prior, right? So you were working for yeah, Larry. That's where I started my career. Larry interviewed me back in the day when he would interview basically everybody coming into the company it was already 900 people, but he'd still managed to find the time to um, interview at least all the engineers that were coming in. So um, right out of, you know, while I was in college, I interviewed with Larry and and uh, struck up a friendship and a relationship with him. 
Um, I started another company after I left Oracle. He helped out with that um, more financially. It was more um, really just my idea, um, building on some of the stuff I'd done at Oracle. And that was right at the dawn of the internet. Um, that didn't work out, it was sort of my mandatory Silicon Valley failure, but I learned a lot about running a business and that's what inspired me to want to do business software. And mm. I came back to Larry with that idea saying, he, you know, he used to call me, he called the stuff I did graphics, graphics, my graphics stuff. Um, we were building, uh, an application to help people make their sites more interactive. And he asked me how my graphics stuff was going. And I said, not so great. We have huge competition. We have loyal set of customers, but we haven't been able to grow the business the way I'd like to. But what I've seen is that I think I want to pivot into business software because I've seen the sort of dearth of good tools for running a business. I mean, in running our business, we had so many different tools. We were running on QuickBooks on someone's computer. QuickBooks did not yet run online. It was many years um, from running online. Um, you know, we used a web store that was disconnected from our financials and we had support happening out of someone's email and sales was out of a contact database. None of this information was integrated. There was no way to find out who really our customers were. There was no sort of single place to go to get the information that I needed. And so I, I saw that lack and, and wanted to really try to address that. Larry at the same time had been thinking deeply about how applications were going to be delivered in the you know the internet age and and really was enamored with this idea of delivering applications over the internet and that really was ultimately the idea that led to the cloud so sort of in a five minute phone conversation when he asked me how things were going we dreamed up this idea of building a you know a business application he very much wanted to start with accounting i wanted to build sort of a more comprehensive application i actually wanted to start with sales and a maybe somewhat ironic aside um, since we didn't start with sales is that a few months later, my friend, Mark Benioff, who I worked very closely with at Oracle said, oh, he was going to start one of these companies, also one of these internet companies delivering software over the internet, and he was going to do sales. And I said, yeah, that'll, that'll probably work out pretty well. Um, and it did. So, uh, that, you know, that really was the, the genesis of the company, this idea that we'd build ultimately, you know, an entire suite, um, of applications to help these fast growing businesses and delivered over the internet. So they didn't have to uh, manage the computers and manage the operating systems and the networks, et cetera. They could really focus on running their business and they could use it anytime, anywhere. And that, you know, that principle of soaring, mar marrying the net with the suite is what uh, was sort of our animating principle through the entire 25 years and remains the focus today. So, to clarify though, you guys, you guys beat Salesforce to market. Is that correct? Three months or so. We started our company about three months before Salesforce did. So yeah, they yes, did it in an apartment in San Francisco and we did it in an apartment in uh, Menlo park. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Very interesting. So I guess I'm curious though, you know, it's, it's, you know, just to put this in context, I mean, we talk about cloud and, you know, uh, creating a cloud solution now and you think, okay, there's a, there's a lot of cloud solutions out there. But this is 1998, and you know a lot of people may not remember 1998. I mean, this is back when, I mean, for, you know, I know Matthew Perry recently passed away. This is back when Friends was famous, oh, yeah. and I uh, mean, you know, just, we've been we've been celebrating our 25 years, so we know all the stuff that was around. You know, Beanie Babies and the Macarena and all that. Right. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I was trying to get at is like in pop culture. You know, just to put it in context, it, it was it was a long time ago. Yes. And you know, not just pop culture was different, but the technology was so different and. And it's it's fascinating to me to think about how you had this vision that somehow the cloud was a good idea because at the time it was not at all obvious that it was a good idea. Now you think, yeah, yeah of course. No, and and you know what, I'll I'll give the credit to that to Larry. Um, I you know I knew I, I wanted to somehow use the internet in building business applications because obviously everything needed to be connected. But this notion that you'd run it in the browser um, that was his, and um, it took me a few months to really see it. Once we got our um, financial information into our own product, into NetSuite, once it was called NetLedger at the time, once we had the capabilities to actually manage our own finances. And then I could see in the browser, all the information you needed. And that was really my vision. It was all about all the information from your business. Um, when I saw that, I was like, oh yeah, this is definitely going to work. I mean, just the access to your information anytime, anywhere. 
and that it was going to work. <laughs> you know, I mean, you had to actually build it to see, right. oh yeah, it, an application like this will function properly <laughs> for managing your business. So he was a little ahead of me on right. that one, but I went along uh, for the ride. And, um, but again, I think nowadays when everything is on in the cloud and it's taken for granted, and it would be very strange to go to a company and say, we want to give you these tools to help manage your business and you have to run them yourself on your own computer. I mean, people would look at you like you were, you know, like you were crazy. Um, now I think what our 20, you know, the 25 years of building a, one system um, that encompasses all the key things you do for a business, acquiring and growing customers, creating, delivering your products and services, hiring and empowering your employees and optimizing, you know, your cash and your profits, all, all those all that sort of functionality within your business and all, all those all those processes when you when your business having one place you can go that ties it all together and then gives you tied up with a nice little bow on one page in your browser everything you need to know about your growing business um, that's sort of what I think is still quite novel and benefits from the 25 years we've been doing that right right. And you started, so you start the company in 98, cloud-based solution. You're working with Larry Ellison. Uh, you, you called it uh, Net Ledger at first. Is that correct? Yeah, that was sort of a failure of vision, I would say. I mean, because that was our first product. And um, it, you know, very well described exactly what the initial customers were getting. Um, but we snapped out of it once we started building the other capabilities like CRM and e-commerce. We're like, oh, yeah, this is a lot more than Net Ledger. So then we called the product NetSuite kept the company name NetLedger. Then um, a, a, we got a, a new CEO. I moved into the chairman role and the chief technology officer role. And um, Zach Nelson, who was our longtime CEO over m most of the history of the company, was immediately like, well, we need to call the company NetSuite. That's really what we do. And so we um, it changed the name and, and it stuck. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, it, it does have a better ring and it's more descriptive of what you guys do exactly. uh, as well. So that was a, a good move. Um, so so Larry Ellison uh, has a vision for the cloud. He obviously helped finance the company. It, was he at all involved in the, you know, in the management or the, the creation I mean, of the product or anything like that? Well, OK, so certainly from a high level strategy perspective, he was involved and I would meet with him um, and talk to him frequently. But the one time that he really dived into the product itself um about probably about two two and a half years in we announced a feature called the executive dashboard and that was really my sort of dream feature that was sort of really for me at that time the culmination of my vision which was sort of one place you know a page you log in a net suite and it would give you your key information that you needed to know the key things that you needed to do again, all in one place. So we announced this uh, feature called the executive dashboard. And of course, every time we did any kind of announcement to the press, we were very um, good about including Larry Ellison's name, <laughs> and the information, right. which would help it get picked up. And so, yeah, so there would pro there's probably some article written and maybe his Google alert for stories that say Larry Ellison. I seriously doubt he has that. But um, <laughs> in never... fact, I'm quite sure he doesn't. Um, but somehow he got wind of this and he called me and he said, oh, you have this dashboard now. OK, well, now I want to log in to NetSuite's um, to NetSuite's account um, and and I'm going to actually use it. And so over the subsequent two months, so not only could he see how we were using his money, but um, he could also uh, uh, look at the dashboard. And, and so he basically became the product manager of the dashboard at that point. And he would call me every couple of days and say, here's what you need to do. You need to add this drop down that will allow you to change the periods of comparison on everything on the dashboard. You need to add this new uh, chart that shows your performance in sales this month versus uh, any previous um, similar time period. So I would dutifully, you know, program that or, or one of my team would, and then I'd call them and say, okay, try it now. It was much easier to release software back then. Right. And, uh, you know, that um, was a really fun time because we were really collaborating, you know, at, at a deep kind of product level um, rather than just at the strategy level. And and yeah. some of the things that he had us do survived to NetSuite to this very day, 20 plus years later. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and again, just put it in context for those that maybe weren't around in the, in the late nineties when this was all happening. Wait, you know, there, sounds- there were people that weren't around. <laughs> yeah. I constantly yeah, talk to employees at NetSuite and I'm like, this was before you were born <laughs> or you were, <laughs> well, and, or you were, two, you were two at the time. You were probably playing with beanie babies at the time that this happened. <laughs> right. Exactly. And you were, you were starting a software company while they were playing with beanie babies. Exactly. But, but if you put it in context though, it sounds so simple now, like, okay, big deal executive dashboard, but that just was not even close to being a thing back in 98. I mean, you had back in 98, you had, in addition to Beanie Babies and the Macarena and all this pop culture stuff we just talked about, you also had green screens. That was still kind of the primary user interface was I had a green screen. I'd enter some sort of memorized transaction code. It wasn't even a GUI or a graphical user interface oftentimes. So these companies are using these really outdated systems. At least some of the bigger ones were, um, QuickBooks maybe wasn't so cumbersome but but point being that the executive dashboards one page sort of thing that just wasn't it just wasn't a thing it, and you guys created that which is pretty cool back then right um, no it, it, it was neat and it was really again the culmination of a lot of work um to allow you to uh do all these different functionalities all these different capabilities manage all these capabilities in your business that normally were disconnected and weren't tied together like your sales um, process and your financial processes and if you did e-commerce and your people processes, etc. Right, right. We're here with Evan Goldberg, the founder of Oracle NetSuite. We've got a lot more to cover. We're going to talk more about the past and the future of cloud enterprise technology. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. Stay tuned. I'm excited to share our newly released 2024 Digital Enterprise Operations Report. This free download is available on the Third Stage website at thirdstage-consulting.com. This report is truly packed full of technology independent and agnostic insights for your project to ensure that you're strategically optimized for success. Download your copy today with the QR code in front of me or visit our website for more details. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 146. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on transformationgroundcontrol.com. And the show is produced by Major Tom Productions. Be sure to check out uh, the website there, majortom-productions.com. Uh, but for more episodes and past episodes that you might have missed, be sure to go to transformationgroundcontrol.com uh, uh, for sure. So we're here in the midst of a conversation with Evan Goldberg, who's the founder of Oracle NetSuite. And uh, we're talking about the past and the future of cloud enterprise technology. Let's jump back into the conversation. One thing I want to understand is, is I'm fascinated by the fact that you guys create this cloud solution that whole, remember the whole ASP movement, you know, the yeah. application service provider movement, it sort of got and a lot some, of hype. Sometimes that would include us, but sometimes it was more like just running an on-premise application in a data center and, and giving you sort of. Um, remote access to that application, which was obviously different than what we were doing, which was sort of pure cloud. Yeah. And that's, that's where I was going with it. I remember that ASP model getting a bit of hype from analysts and it, it seemed like, you know, that might get some traction and take off and it never really did, at least not in the early 2000s, whenever that was, how did you guys, you know, you guys, you, you were built in the cloud, you stuck with the cloud, you never went on premise, you never, you know, you, did you ever, I guess my question is, did you ever look at this ASP movement that sort of came and went and on premise just stuck around for a long time and in some pockets of the of the industry still is sticking around, but did you ever question the cloud or, or was it ever frustrating that the cloud didn't take off sooner or like, how did you guys? Well, persevere? yeah, it, it was, it was definitely frustrating. Uh, you know, the way I remember it, um, you know, we'd have to go to relatively conservative parts of the business because we were starting with the financials. And so we were talking to controllers and CFOs of fast growing companies and, the, you know, they were the, maybe the most risk averse. And so convincing them to try this new thing and put their data on the internet could be a challenge. Now, typically what I'd do is I'd say, well, where's your data now? And they'd say, oh, it's in this computer over there in our closet with the coffee stain on it. And I'm like, you're not concerned that someone could steal that computer. It seems like it's not very secure. We keep our computers in this, you know, modern 
data center where you need a handprint to get in. So that was step one. But often, you know, we definitely rode the coattails of sales, the salesforce.com hype machine. And so, of course, many of these companies were also using salesforce.com. And I'd talk, I say to the CFO, well, you know that your entire customer list and prospect list is already on the internet and you're really worried that they want your income statement. <laughs> so, right. Um, you know, we certainly, it certainly did help that the Mark um, and his uh, marketing um, prowess was uh, telling the world that you didn't need software. He called it no software, which we would laugh about a little bit behind the scenes because we'd be like, well, it seems, feels like we're developing software, but apparently not. Um, but that was, you know, an effect, you know, one of those effective, not completely accurate slogans, but that captured people's attention and got people to think about, maybe I don't want to manage software and maybe I want someone else to do it for me. Maybe this stuff really should be a service. I mean, one of the really the most revolutionary things about the whole cloud movement for business software is, and we realized it very early on, just months into the company, we were up, or, you know, months into our product, where our first product was released less than a year from when we started, uh, from when we started the company. And a few months later, we're upgrading customers to the next version. And there's some problems with the upgrade. And we're having like the typical problems that a customer normally had to have. And that's when it occurred to us, oh, we're delivering a service. Like <laughs> they, they need us to be doing this all the time, 24-7 you know, customers would come in with problems with their e-commerce site on like Christmas Eve and we had to fix them because we were a service. We mm -hmm. weren't just writing software and throwing it over the wall and daring them to install it and run it. So in that sense, you know, Mark's slogan was right. It was no longer software. It was a service and thus the name mm -hmm. software as a service. Gotcha. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, that's a big cultural shift I imagine too for a a bunch of techies and developers absolutely and that creating yeah. software not a service well, and fortunately we got over that quite quickly and and there were only a few of us so changing the culture from a product to a service was quite easy and then has sort of imbued you know our our dna ever since then yeah yeah so here's a comment from na from miami on linkedin na says it's great to be reminded of how far we've come along so thank you for that comment and here's a question from Kyler on LinkedIn. And she asked, looking back, what is one piece of knowledge you wish you had before deploying and building and creating this cloud solution? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think, I, I don't know if there's one piece of knowledge I, I wish I had. Um, certainly, I think, um, the, well, I mentioned the name of the company. I wish I'd been... Uh, we'd been smart enough to be a little more visionary in naming the company. Obviously, years later, that that's just a, a little blip. But at the time, it was it was hard. So I guess I wish I'd known that we were actually going to be successful at all these other pieces that we needed to do. Um, I you know I, the road to getting people to the cloud, as I said, was hard, and it was like pushing you know a big boulder up a hill. Um, so I guess at the time you know, where you always have doubts when you're building something. And, and I guess I, I wish I had known that this was going to be just taken for granted. I mean, Larry was very convinced. He would say, oh yeah, this is how people are going to be deploying applications for the next thousand years. I don't know what's going to happen after that. Well, we're 25 years uh, in and he only has 975 years to be right. Right. <laughs> so I guess yeah. just the knowledge you know, even even the knowledge that this was inevitable, I guess, would have um, maybe helped us uh, in that we would have not second guessed anything <laughs> we did. Right. I mean, there were customers that asked us, "Oh, could we keep the da data at our location?" Um, because we're not sure we trust the cloud. Unfortunately, we said no. But maybe we would have said no a little faster if we'd known that. Believe me, you will not be asking that question in ten years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so funny to think about it. Just, it wasn't that long ago where I heard that all the time from CIOs. Like, I don't know that I trust the cloud. I trust my server in the back room. That's not locked, but I, I don't exactly. trust it. it was, it's just funny to think that that wasn't that long ago, that that, that was the mindset. So kudos for sticking with it. I think that's a yeah. <laughs> good case study in perseverance. Success and, uh, is just, yeah, it's showing up <laughs> yeah. every day. 
Well, and it's interesting now because, you know, I, I always mention this to um, potential buyers of enterprise tech, especially ones that are enamored by the cloud or SaaS solutions. And they might be looking at, you know, um, SAP or Microsoft Dynamics or whatever, in addition to potentially NetSuite. And it's always, you know, you always have to say, you know, look at the, look at how the software is built, you know, is, are you really getting a cloud solution with many of your competitors with, with a lot of the ERP vendors out there? Are you really getting a cloud solution? Or are you getting an on-premise system that they're trying to move to the cloud as we speak and they're selling it as a cloud solution? Whereas with NetSuite, you know what you're getting for better or for worse, you know exactly what you're getting with NetSuite. It was built in the cloud. It's not, you know, you're not trying to make that transition now like a lot of a lot of software vendors are. Yeah, right. What are your no, that that's true. And and users won't necessarily see it superficially because they're using it in a browser and they're like, oh, this is a cloud solution. But when you sort of, you know, build a cloud solution with uh, you know, shoestring and bubble gum and really under the covers, it was architected to be on premise. What you end up with is, for example, people on many different versions. Um, and what that means is that just stifles innovation. Um, obviously, you don't get access to the latest capabilities until you're willing to, you know, upgrade. Um, and so that, you know, the, the speed of upgrades, the speed with which we can make sure that everybody gets all the innovation that we're doing is due to the fact that we really have truly one, we're running one system in the cloud. We're not running a bunch of different versions. We're not running a bunch of different things for different customers. So on the surf, you know, you might not see these differences between the architecture on the surface, but you'll see them ultimately in your experience of using these different products. Right, right. Now, when you look at the 25 years so far um, with NetSuite, what are you, what accomplishment or accomplishments are you most proud of? Well, I'm certainly extremely proud of the companies that we've been able to help grow and the achievements that they've had and the visions that they've been able to achieve. I mean, we're really just there to help. Um, we don't make your business work. Ultimately, that's your idea, your sweat, your toil, um, and uh, and whether your you know your vision really is something that people want and and so and and continue to build it and architect it in such a way that you please your customers and they want to come back so we just help with that so certainly i'm very very proud that we've helped with so many amazing companies that are doing incredible things and also lots of amazing nonprofits. we have a large footprint um in nonprofits that you know in nonprofits these days really do want to run like a company they you know their roi the R in their ROI is is impact maybe versus dollars, hmm. but um, at the, but they still want that ROI, and you know we help give them that. And so that's certainly one of the things I'm most proud of, and the team that we've built. Um, you never are successful in these companies without amazing people, and many of the people that I work with still on a day to day day to day basis have been through most of NetSuite's history 10, 15, 20 years with the company um, at the same time as we continue to bring amazing new people into the organization that can bring new ideas, um, but, all, but, you know, within the sort of framework of our culture. So the people in the culture that we build, um, and I think that ultimately gets reflected in the products that we deliver. So that's certainly another thing that I'm incredibly proud of. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Now I, I, um, I was had the opportunity to go to NetSuite or to uh, Sweet World which is your annual conference uh, a couple of weeks ago in Las Vegas. And you and I got to meet there and um, I got to meet a lot of people in the NetSuite community there. But one thing you mentioned and you talked about, you talked about a couple of things in your keynote. You talked about a lot of things in your keynote. But when I when I asked you to summarize in, in for one of my YouTube videos that just came out, uh, sort of my debrief of Sweet World, um, I asked you kind of like, what what are you most excited about? You know, when you think about you know, the most important developments that you're working on right now, you and your team are working on now at NetSuite. And you talked about artificial intelligence, and then you talked about, um, I'll call it user experience, even though you have right. a, maybe a different definition of that or a broader definition than just user experience. But those are the two things you mentioned to me when I asked you, I, when I said, what are the two biggest things that you said, AI, user experience? Can you maybe talk about yeah. why those two no, things are important? I, I, I think user experience is a great way of putting it. I mean, that is pretty all encompassing. What is your experience of using this business application? And the experience of using business applications typically has been less than ideal. I mean, people are sort of forced to use it and they come into work and they're like, oh, okay, I got to navigate my way through this thing that's kind of confusing. And 
um, clunky. And the next generation of business users, the next generation of employees in business come from a world where they have incredibly rich technology at their fingerprints, at their fingertips, sorry, um, on their phones and, you know, on their laptops, et cetera, that, you know, they're using for their daily life, their personal life. And they come in and they're, that's sort of what they're expecting. Like, why can't my business application be like that? And so that's what we're striving for is, you know, an application that you come in on Monday morning and you don't mind using. Uh, you actually might even like it. Um, it helps you get your job done. It uses a lot of the techniques that you're familiar with that are being used you know, in other applications that are on your phone or on your laptop. And um, so I think that's incredibly important. And, and we've been working on it for many years and we've been collaborating with Oracle, which um, I didn't expect when I came back here that Oracle ha would have such a deep investment in the user experience and changing and revolutionizing what it's like to interact with these applications. And then AI, well, AI is very much a part of that. These two efforts of improving the business user experience and delivering, I get, you know, what human-like assistance um, and advice, they're very interconnected. And I think that the, the interface of the future may involve a lot of talking. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're doing on our phones more and more. Um, a conversational UI requires AI. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, it's deeply, they're deeply interconnected. And of course, what the user experience should be delivering is great advice and assistance for your business. And um, that's, you know, that's what we believe that AI has the capability to do by the rich data that we have in NetSuite, which really encompasses all of your key business processes tying that all together and then being able to make um, predictions, suggest things, automate things, help you uh, get through the drudgery of your everyday work so that you can instead concentrate on strategy and, and other um, you know, aspects of the business that maybe you can add more value. That's what we're all about at NetSuite. And it's, it's, a next, it's the next revolution after the cloud, the way I see it, in, in the ability. The cloud allowed us to build a sophisticated application that encompasses much of your business and then deliver it anytime, anywhere. That was revolutionary. Now we can go to the next level in the type of advice and assistance we can give you um, to really make this application orders of magnitude more effective uh, in helping you grow your business and achieve your vision. So super excited about sort of both those efforts. Yeah, we're here with Evan Goldberg, the founder of Oracle NetSuite. We've got a lot more to cover. We're going to talk more about the past and the future of cloud enterprise technology. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. Stay tuned. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 146. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on transformationgroundcontrol.com. And the show is produced by Major Tom Productions. Be sure to check out uh, the website there, majortom-productions.com. Uh, but for more episodes and past episodes that you might have missed, be sure to go to transformationgroundcontrol.com uh, uh, for sure. So we're here in the midst of a conversation with Evan Goldberg, who's the founder of Oracle NetSuite. And uh, we're talking about the past and the future of cloud enterprise technology. Let's jump back into the conversation. 
when I asked people at the conference, I, so I put out a YouTube video where um, I was at Sweet World and I asked people um, what they're most excited about with, with the NetSuite developments and the announcements that had happened at Sweet World. And it was it, hands down AI was the the number one response. I mean, I, I can't even remember what the close second, if, if there was no close second, but I don't yeah. even care. No, well, well, and of course, it's all you read about these days. And, and um, so everybody's just getting from sort of the general media um, the sense that there is a revolution. And this one does feel different than the last hype cycle. <laughs> you mm, know? Yeah. And there have been hype cycles between in the last 25 years that didn't really pan out. Um, and they were more like technologists being very enamored with something. This feels very different. Uh, and obviously, you know, again, obviously be because of the general press, but also um, I think people can see much more clearly how it's going to help them in their daily lives. And that's what we're in this for is to help people in their daily work lives um, move faster, do more with less. And I think people see, yeah, this is really going to, I mean, the very nature of some of the, you know, the uh, large language models is they help you develop content much more quickly than you could before research things more quickly than you could before. Um, and so that's, you know, great example, doing more with less. We think AI is much more to offer than that over time and um, all aspects of using these applications and, and running your business. It's all about um, that efficiency and productivity you can get when um, the computer can do more, uh, allowing you to, you know, shift your focus to higher value tasks. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and, people, and people really, they get it. Cause yeah. they do, cause they know they have a lot of things in their life that they could really, really benefit from uh, being ma made more productive, more efficient and, or taking it off their plate completely in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to hear you just a moment ago, talk about how, you know, your, your, the purpose of NetSuite is to help companies grow. I think that's super fascinating because you don't hear that enough in this space. It's all about the technology and we're building cool stuff and, that's cool, but I, I like how you have this this broader purpose that you see. Yeah, we, we want to be purposely uncool. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> obviously, we, we want to use cool technology when it will help. But a lot of what we do, some of what we do is just getting out of people's way. I mean, the best user experience in some cases is no user experience. Let me give you an example. Like, everybody that works for a company has to deal with expense reports. And, um, you know, you can have a cool interface to allow you to drag and drop and associate this expense with this category, blah, blah, blah. That all looks cool. But what you really want to happen is take a picture of the receipt and then get reimbursed. And that's the entire experience. Right. And so that's like, there's no user interface in between that. The user interface is your camera. And then looking at your bank account and seeing that you got reimbursed. Right. I mean, that should be the user experience. So in that sense, Behind the scenes, there's some super cool technology, but it's not actually exposed to the user, um, and it's it's really just sort of getting out of the getting out of the user's way, getting out of an employee's way. So they again, they're not doing expense reports; they're doing things that are more useful. Yeah, right. Here's a a spicier question from the audience here uh, from Dennis on LinkedIn. How are you, or how's NetSuite? Not you personally, but how's NetSuite uh, better than SAP Business One? curious to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, well, every customer has to decide, you know, what is right for them. Um, we've found that in a lot of cases, um, NetSuite has an advantage because it is more of an all-encompassing application that, cover, you know, against many different solutions, it has more capabilities across the board to really automate these larger things that you're doing in your business, not just, you know, reporting your financials. So that's one advantage we have over some other products. Some other products are, like we described earlier, um, not built for the cloud. They are on-premise applications that in some cases are being hosted. They've sort of been repurposed for the cloud. But then you're always on a different version uh, from your, you know, from other customers. It's harder for the software company to be able to deliver value. And you don't necessarily get that value if you're not on the, on the right version. So that's the difference between sort of like the application service provider model that you described from 20 years ago and, um, and a true, and a true cloud solution. So those are some of the things um, 
that when you know we look at other you know when companies look at other products might attract them uh, to NetSuite. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you compete often in uh, certain parts of the world? Do you compete often with SAP Business One, or who are your main competitors? Yeah, that's definitely one of the solutions we see. Um, honestly, um, our our biggest competition is a company deciding not not yet. I'm, I don't need something like NetSuite yet, and so they don't mm -hmm. do anything sort of yeah. status quo. And um, but in, you know, inevitably, what I say to those customers is, you're going to do it. <laughs> And, you know, right. get on the bandwagon now. I mean, certainly if you're a tech company, two thirds plus tech companies are going on NetSuite. So I'm like, just, you know, it's easier to do it earlier. So just do it. But still, some, it's got to be the right time for companies. Yeah. So that's sort of typically what we compete against. But, you know, certainly people do evaluations and have to find um, the solution that's right for them in their industry. There's some industries that we don't don't generally cover though that's increasing um rapidly uh, we have a, a an organization here at oracle that serves local government and um unbeknownst to us they were evaluating wow we think netsuite could be a great solution for local governments and so now there's an oracle solution for local governments that's built on netsuite and they took some of the um capabilities we built for not-for-profits and they used netsuite's extensibility layer i mean the other part of netsuite that i'm super super proud of is how easy it is to extend NetSuite. I mean, I came to this world from building application development tools. That's what my first company, Embed Software, was doing. That's what I was doing back in the day at Oracle. And so I didn't know really anything about accounting except for a user. On the first day of NetLedger, I had to go out and buy an accounting textbook. Fortunately, I soon hired a product manager that <laughs> knew much more than I did. But what I did know is, is how to rapidly build applications, low code application developments before it was cool. I mean, I was working on low code application developments back in the literally the eighties um, at Oracle. And um, so that was sort of built into NetSuite is this ability to easily extend it without, you know, necessarily going to code though. We do have JavaScript and, and something we call SuiteScript, which is extensions to JavaScript. Um, the world's most popular programming language if you do want to extend NetSuite with code. And of course, a lot of our partners use that. So this ability to extend NetSuite is what this local government uh, organization in Oracle, they took that and they built all the capabilities that are needed by local government. Now we have a product for local government. So that's super exciting mm -hmm. is the extension of NetSuite in the industries that maybe we, you know, we do cover a ton of industries. And by the way, this is an aside, this whole notion of, industries is rapidly changing because companies are blurring the lines. We've been saying this for years. Service companies are becoming product companies. Product companies are becoming service companies. You see it in many of the consumer products that we use that are a combination of a piece of hardware and a service. And NetSuite is sort of uniquely, that's another when we talk about um, other products, they may be particularly good at one part of that equation, but now you really need to be good at everything. And we have very powerful companies uh, capabilities for service companies that deliver services and very powerful capabilities for companies that deliver products so sort of a hybrid company which is increasingly how a lot of companies are being built benefits from our expertise in both of those areas very interesting kind of along those lines though um you're talking about extensibility and and development to, uh, of the solution if if you want to extend the capabilities uh, this is a question from linkedin what are your views on the customization some of the NetSuite customers are making yeah. on their on their end? Do you see that as a risk with too much customization? That's a fantastic question. And we saw years ago that this could be a double-edged sword. And even within, you know, we have a kind of unique organization in this way also, which also separates us from some of these other products in that we have a very, very robust um, cu customer success and, cu and customer delivery organization where we do the implementation, NetSuite does the implementations for the majority of our customers. And we, you know, we've built a incredible team and an incredible methodology there. Um, obviously we also generally are the ones we do sell through partners, but generally NetSuite sells it. We, we're really a full service organization that there hasn't really ever existed something like that for companies in this size, you know, that have outgrown their initial accounting package, but aren't ready for the, and maybe never ready for these, big, big applications like, um, like SAP. And, uh, you know, there really hasn't been this offering of a sort of one-stop shop that can sell you the capabilities and, and service them and implement them 
do post go live services to help you become successful. And obviously we build, we build it ourselves. But in the earlier days of NetSuite, you know, our even our team and uh, sometimes partners would take the fact that you could build anything on NetSuite. I mean, it is a full application development environment. You could build NetSuite on NetSuite um, and, and maybe went too far, kind of gave or companies a blank canvas and said, what do you want to do? And we'll do it. <clears throat> we saw the pitfalls of that. And I think that's what the questioner is sort of referring to, that you can get too much customization. It becomes hard to maintain. People leave your company or or you know, wherever and don't understand that stuff because it's so complicated. Well, there's a lot, bunch of things we've done to do that. I mean, you only get down in a code if you need to. We have very easy point and click customization to add new data types to to uh, to NetSuite, to uh, manage workflows. Um, we have a workflow manager, it's point and click. So we have a lot of tools that help you avoid getting in code. But nevertheless, we saw this issue and we determined to change it. And really one of the, I think one of the most revolutionary things we've done in NetSuite is something called Suite Success, which is where we take um, our, the best practices that we've been implementing one at a time for customers in a particular industry, in a particular segment, in a particular geography and bundle them up so that you don't have to do them. And then what that leads to is when we show you NetSuite in a sales situation, that's actually what you're gonna get because we have chosen what we call the sweet success edition, which is the, 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 the package of these appropriate best practice capabilities for your type of company. We've packaged that together. That's what we show you when we demo the product. That's what we implement when it comes time to implement. And so they, you know, selling what we deliver and delivering what we sell is a really important part of our strategy. Of course, every customer is different. But when you go to them and ask what you want and say, by the way, in your industry, here's how we have implemented the, you know, procure to pay process. And a lot of times they'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, the thing that we're do doing, we came up with ourselves when we were 10 people and it actually isn't working great for us now. And that looks great. And so they'll adopt a lot of the best practices and approaches that we have in Sweet Success. But sometimes for their secret sauce and what makes them special during night, no, we have to do this particular thing. This is how we do our um, product delivery, or this is you know a particular part of it. There's a, this part of order management that's very special that we think is better than our competition. And so th for that part, maybe 10%, we can go in and really customize it to make sure it is implemented the way you need it um, to make sure your business is putting its best foot forward on what you're best at. So that's sort of what we've... Um, evolved to. And I think that is how we address the problem that I think that questioner or that question is referring to. We're here with Evan Goldberg, the founder of Oracle NetSuite. We've got a lot more to cover. We're going to talk more about the past and the future of cloud enterprise technology. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. Stay tuned. When I wake up, well, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who wakes up next to you. When I go out, Hi, this is Eric Kimberling with Third Stage Consulting and your host of Transformation Ground Control. I want to encourage you to read our Guide to Organizational Change Management. It's a free report or a free guide that we published. It's one that I actually wrote that talks about best practices and lessons learned as it relates to change management. So as you know, on this podcast, we cover a lot of stuff related to the human sides of change, organizational change management, including training, communications, org design, all kinds of stuff as it relates to change management. So if you're trying to learn more about change management, or you're looking for more direction and ideas on how to get started on your change management strategy and your overall journey, be sure to check out this guide. You can read it by scanning the QR code on the screen in front of you, or in the links below for this particular podcast episode, you can find a link to uh, take you to the page that will allow you to register to go ahead and download that and read it for free. So be sure to check it out. It's the guide to organizational change management uh, written by yours truly. Hope you enjoy it. Let me know what you think and hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 146. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on transformationgroundcontrol.com. And this show is produced by Major Tom Productions. Be sure to check out uh, the website there, majortom-productions.com. Uh, but for more episodes and past episodes that you might have missed, be sure to go to transformationgroundcontrol.com. Uh, 
Uh, for sure. So we're here in the midst of a conversation with Evan Goldberg, who's the founder of Oracle NetSuite. And uh, we're talking about the past and the future of cloud enterprise technology. Let's jump back into the conversation. I was fascinated at Sweet World too, by the way, with how many partners are in your ecosystem that are they're creating these not custom solutions, but they're creating within the NetSuite platform. They're creating um, niche or you know um, you know industry best practices, industry specific, and, yeah. or you know extending some capabilities of NetSuite where we may not go far enough for some companies. It's great, and that is certainly another thing I'm incredibly proud of. And that is especially I'm incredibly proud of it because they're using this platform, which, as I said, that's the thing I actually knew about <laughs> when I came, when I, you know, when I started NetSuite. So that's that's really exciting to me and something that we will always continue to nourish and um, and, and value as part of our offering. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so here's a question from, um, let me pull it up here. It's getting a little bit sort of technical, but not not super technical, I suppose. Uh, this is from Liberty on YouTube. Liberty asks, a lot of SaaS have moved services to AWS or Google Cloud. While this may be more reliable because of the infrastructure these two giants have, it also concentrates the catastrophic risk in two companies. Um, so it's a comment uh, more than anything. Yeah, I mean, interesting. interesting. I mean, um, we've made no secret of the fact that we've moved to Oracle's cloud infrastructure, which is, you know, a similar... Um, hyperscaler, you know, big, big provider of computing power over the internet. Um, and that's been great for us. Um, it allows us to expand to new data centers around the world. It takes, it, it kind of gives this, it's the same promise they give us as we gave to customers back in the day. Like we said, you don't have to manage operating systems and you don't have to manage software upgrades um, and compatibility. Well, they're like, you don't have to manage computers and networks and, and we'll do that for you. And that's great. It gets, just allows us to focus on what's important in, in our business. And, um, you know, all of our customers on OCI, they've seen significant performance gains. As I said, we can put all of our Australia customers in an Australia data center. So that's been super exciting um, for us. And, uh, you know, it's a similar promise that I think these other services are providing to uh software companies, um, you know, and the fact we had to build everything ourselves back in the day, you know, I joke about how, and, you know, I'd go to customers and say, we have our, you know, we manage your data in a professionally managed data center. Well, the first version of net ledger was in a computer in our office, just like our customers. Right. Um, we didn't have access to AWS or Azure or Oracle cloud infrastructure. Um, back then we had to do it ourselves. So and I guess I envy, a little bit these uh the next generation startups that have that available to them right yeah it, it definitely lowers the barriers to entry uh, for sure, sure. imagine compared to what you dealt with in, in back in 98 especially um what when you think about the enterprise tech space in general um what do you think the biggest misconception is that analysts and potential buyers have about NetSuite? In other words, you know, what, where, where does perception not match reality in your well, opinion? Uh, you know, I think they call us cloud ERP and look, we're guilty of marketing ourselves as cloud ERP because there's a certain group of people that understand that though. I'm not sure it's all of next generation entrepreneurs that know either what that stands for or even heard of it. So we have to, you know, that's just part of our, our sort of outreach strategy. But I think these, industry terms like ERP and CRM and HCM are somewhat constraining. So I think the misconception is that we are just a cloud ERP provider when we really provide much more, because again, we're thinking about it much more holistically. We're trying to break down the barriers between these different sort of industry terms that, that we've come up with as an industry that really aren't connected to how users think about their business, especially fast growing companies that are still very interleaved and weaved together. You know, everybody's doing everything <laughs> and like, you know, the person that's doing sales is also, you know, probably um, uh, screwing in, you know, <laughs> things into the wall and doing facilities at the same time. I mean, everybody, you know, that's the nature of a startup. I've been there um, a couple times and um, everything is really tightly tied together. And that was my frustration when I had this 15 person company with like six different applications to run our business. That's like one application per two and a half people. I mean, right, that's too right. many. So I think that's maybe the misconception is that we fall into one of these traditional 
uh, software categories when really we're doing something that's that's uh, that's quite different in, in in encompassing so much of what you do as a fast growing startup. Yeah, yeah, makes total sense. Um, here's a really interesting question that just came from uh, LinkedIn. This is from Neilan on LinkedIn, and he says, as demand for NetSuite grows, how does NetSuite think about training talent within the ecosystem, both on the implementation and post implementation yeah. side? I mean, we have a very um, sophisticated and uh, broad education program that we deliver um, to users and to partners um, that, uh, you know, encompasses all the, you know, the capabilities NetSuite and, you know, multimodal. I mean, obviously there's, there's written documentation, there's videos, there's classes. Um, so, you know, we, we definitely put an emphasis on education and, um, everybody that ha has NetSuite has access to that. And then there's, um, ability to do more custom things. Some customers want sort of custom, customized education for their, for their company, but, um, it's, it's incredibly important. Of course, we want to make the software self-documenting to the degree that we can, but especially for developers, there's always going to be a, a need, need for that. And that's why we have things like Sweet World. Sweet World is an ability, you know, with the, with all the sessions to learn a ton and then also make mm -hmm. the connections that you need, you know, to be able to get your, your questions answered down the road. Um, you know, and again, you talked about all the partners we have. We're fortunate many of those partners are started up by, you know, have been started up by people that have worked at NetSuite in the past and employee, you know, and it, we never like anyone leaving NetSuite, but if they go to a partner and help them be successful, it's something that's going to help our ecosystem um that's that's a positive thing so it's definitely a process you know there's always a, a need for people with with net suite skills and education i'd encourage people you know if you're involved in some way in in net suite or in the net suite ecosystem to build those skills because i think you know again with our success in tens of thousands of companies and we obviously have ambitions for it getting up into even more digits um there's a lot of opportunity there for people to deliver um to deliver to these customers um, beyond what obviously we can do as a as a single organization. Yeah, yeah, makes makes total sense. And I think that's uh, you know, back to your point earlier about how your biggest competition is not another software vendor per se, but it's the the companies themselves or the potential customers that are doing do that. nothing. Yeah, they, <laughs> do nothing is what we call it. D N. It's a two letter right. acronym. <laughs> yeah, the, the dirty word that every salesperson hates to hear. Um, but what, um, what, what are you guys doing to, how do you address some of the challenges that a smaller or high growth organization has in implementing new technology, which every organization struggles to, yeah, some degree, absolutely. With, with but, but well, high know, growth companies, I think they have their, their own unique challenges. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, they don't want it to be a big bureaucratic heavyweight process. They're like, you know, let's just get her done. And so we have to balance the need to do it right and do it well and use best practices with their need for it to happen quickly and easily. And they don't have a lot of time on their hands to be working on this. So we're always trying to tune our processes to make that, you know, as, as painless as possible. Again, one of the biggest things is sweet success. The fact mm -hmm. that we already have much of it implemented for you yeah. <laughs> because we've done it for 5,000 other companies like you. And um, then the last mile part, obviously making that as, as painless as possible. We're, we're working really hard on that alongside our user experience is the adoption experience. And we expect to see that improve in leaps and bounds over the coming years from a lot of work that we've been doing behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, taking our 25 years of experience of, of, of delivering these tech, this technology, these technology solutions to customers that, are low on resources that don't have an IT department, or if they do, it's one person who's also, you know, as I said, selling on the side or what, right. or, or do, managing the website or doing the, you know, write, writing the marketing content. Fortunately, they have AI to do that for them now. But um, yeah, so the, you know, that's the environment in which we deliver these solutions. Um, and we're very tuned, tuned to that, to that. And we're just taking, you know, our experience and really trying to build it into the process to make it as painless and get you up and running on NetSuite and, and get you that rich information um, and those productivity boosts that you, you know, signed up with us for in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what's next? Where do you see NetSuite? Um, how do you see NetSuite evolving and its position in the marketplace with the product itself? Yeah. Where, where do you see the future of NetSuite? 
Well, certainly, you know, the themes we talked about earlier and that I um, talked about at our user at Sweet World, um, you know, next generation business user experience that's much more approachable, friendly, easy, AI that really helps you in your daily tasks and, and helps identify patterns and suggest courses of action, helps you accomplish those courses of action easily. That's where all our focus is. And I think you'll just see over the coming years more and more of that come to fruition. We have a vision. In fact, I delivered a vision at Sweet World of what NetSuite could look like in the future. And much of it is available right now with technology. We just has to have to get it done. So we are, you know, have our nose to the grindstone on delivering this great value as soon as we can to our existing customers. Again, because everybody's on the same version, everybody's going to get it. Mm -hmm. And um, and then they'll give us feedback and we'll improve it. You know, we listen. That's the most important way that we improve the product is by listening to our existing users. And, um, you know, I, I think at each year, year in, year out, we're going to be showing how we can um, help customers even more easily um, use NetSuite to achieve their transform their companies and achieve their vision. All right. Thank you, Evan. Great conversation and uh, great questions from the audience. And uh, really interesting to hear the journey from the way things were in 1998 and the way technology was in 1998. It sounds so simple to create a cloud uh, software company, but uh, not only is it not simple to start a company of any sort, uh, including a tech company, but especially back then when cloud computing was not a thing, it was not widespread, it wasn't well known or well understood at the time and nobody was really doing it. So it's really interesting to hear that journey back in 98 to where we are today in the enterprise tech space within the cloud world, as well as where we're headed in the future with AI and user interface and some of the other things that, that Evan talked about. So it's a great conversation there, uh, a, lot of, a lot of good takeaways. And if you haven't uh, already, be sure to check out my YouTube channel. Uh, if you go to my YouTube channel and just search uh, NetSuite Sweet World, um, you'll find a video I published just a couple weeks ago that uh, is from my visit to the annual NetSuite conference, which is called Sweet World, um, I interview for a few minutes, I interview Evan, not in nearly as much detail as I just did in this podcast, but I do interview him for a few minutes in that video, as well as other people that were at Sweet World to find out what they're excited about and what some of their observations are about uh, where NetSuite is headed with their, with their product line. So really interesting um, video. If you want to check that out, you can find that on my YouTube channel. I'll, I'll include a link to that in the description field below as well. So uh, great conversation. Great having him on. We'd love to have him on as a guest in the future as well. So always good to chat with a pioneer in the enterprise tech space uh, on this show, which is what we try to bring to you is a, a lot of a lot of great thought leaders and pioneers in the space. So speaking of thought leaders and pioneers in the space, we are going to bring on two more guests here after a quick break. We're going to bring on uh, Kyler Cheatham and Wayne Holtham from Third Stage Consulting. Uh, Kyler is our marketing director and Wayne is the managing director of our Asia Pacific office out of Australia. And he manages all of our Asia Pacific clients and, and team members down there. Kyler and Wayne are going to talk about the uh, soap opera that is SAP implementations, SAP ERP implementations. So if you're going through an SAP implementation, there's a lot of very specific uh, challenges and pitfalls and risks and success factors to be aware of that we'll talk about here. Uh, in just a moment. Um, and even if you're not going through SAP, if you're going through some sort of other ERP implementation or any other sort of digital transformation, you'll find some good nuggets of lessons in this conversation as well. So I encourage you to stick around for that. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll have Wayne and Kyler on the show, but we'll take a quick break first. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. I'm excited to share our newly released 2024 Digital Enterprise Operations Report. This free download is available on the Third Stage website at thirdstage-consulting.com. This report is truly packed full of technology independent and agnostic insights for your project to ensure that you're strategically optimized for success. Download your copy today with the QR code in front of me or visit our website for more details. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 146. My name is Eric Kimberling. You can find new episodes of this show every week at transformationgroundcontrol.com. You can also go to transformationgroundcontrol.com to see past episodes that you may have missed, and you can also use that as a platform to subscribe and, and uh, 
include the weekly uh, podcast in your feed, wherever you listen or watch the podcast. So be sure to check that out. Um, excited for our next guest. You're going to hear from Wayne Holtham and Kyler Cheatham from the Third Stage Consulting Team. Um, Wayne is uh, part of our Third Stage Asia Pacific office. And not only does he run that office in Asia Pacific, but he also has done quite a few SAP implementations in his past and his current uh, work uh, scope it involves a lot of SAP work as well. And even though third stage consulting is independent, as is Wayne and, and Kyler, uh, we're technology agnostic. We're not affiliated with SAP. We do more than just SAP implementations. We also do NetSuite implementations, uh, you know, having just spoken with, uh, with, with Evan from NetSuite, and we deal with other uh, software vendors and help clients select and implement other types of solutions as well. So we're technology agnostic. We're not affiliated with any of these vendors that we're here talking about here this week, but we thought we'd hone in on SAP implementations because they have their own unique challenges and risks. So we thought we'd dive into uh, some of the lessons from SAP implementations and, and uh, provide it, uh, sort of unpack SAP implementations in the context of a uh, of a drama, if you will, uh, or a soap opera. So we're going to talk about the soap opera and the drama that goes on in SAP implementations. And most importantly, how can we resolve? How can we get to resolution on some of those challenges and, and turn it from a drama into a success story? And that's really what we want to do here today. So with that all being said, we're going to turn it over to Kyler, who's going to ask Wayne some questions as it relates to SAP implementations. So I'll hand it off to you, Kyler. Well, thank you, Eric. I am very excited to welcome Wayne here from our APAC team um, to talk about some global SAP challenges. Um, so welcome, Wayne. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Kyla. Great to be here. It's really uh, good to be back on uh, talking to you. Yeah, a veteran member of Transformation Ground Control. So we are very excited to have you back. And today we're talking um, kind of almost as a capstone conversation of what we've talked about a lot this year, which is kind of SAP epidemic of failures that we've seen. And whether it's high profile news stories, whether it's our own client work when it comes to our restoration and rescue projects, and even our expert witness work, which we're able to do because we have that technology agnostic and independent positioning in the marketplace. So with that, we came up with a, a fun way to kind of talk about it today. And, and we're talking about um, control S for sanity, surviving the soap opera of SAP implementations. Um, so Wayne, I, I Again, I, I know much of our audience knows you, but if you wouldn't mind, would you just give us a quick background um, of what you do here at Third Stage and kind of your um, overall experience with SAP? Yeah, sure. I'm Wayne Holfam. I'm the Vice President for the uh, APAC region, so I'm based in Australia. And probably my background is I've spent the last 25, maybe even a bit longer, I'd don't care to admit that, but um, years in, in in digital transformation, a lot of them have been SAP rollouts. And so uh, there's been good, there's been bad, and there's been really ugly. So Yeah. Yeah. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, we're going to cover all of, all of that today. But as Wayne said, he manages a lot of our APAC business or all of our APAC business, as well as a lot of our global clients, because we do have clients, you know, that have have parts across the globe that we kind of tackle as a team-based approach. And if you want to see more from Wayne as kind of pre-work for this conversation, he's actually on our playlist and you can um, see all of his, specifically my personal favorites are the process mining and the target operating model he talks about too. But today we're going to talk a little bit about SAP. So Wayne, kind of big question here is why are SAP implementations so difficult? Yeah. Well, it's always the big challenge because if you talk to the salesperson for SAP, they aren't difficult. They're very easy to actually roll out. But the challenge is the organization, SAP is quite detailed and it's quite, it requires a lot of understanding of who you are as an organization, as well as how you go about the business you actually do. And um, often um, they're sold as if, oh no, we'll just put our approach in and just roll it out and everything will be all fine on the day. And um, and that's that's the challenge. And I suppose where some of the failures happen is that if we an SAP client already, and we've had SAP for a number of years, and then we're moving to a new, the S4, the problem with that is that previously we could sort of do what we wanted. We could customise it to suit our every need. And then when we get to the new S4, it's not as easy to be able to do that. And so um, so that's that's often where that transition is not just an upgrade anymore. It's actually a, a complete shift uh, in the way you think, the way you operate, the, all the screens you see, 
Um, and that's, that's what's so difficult. So it sounds like even if you had a legacy SAP product, moving to specifically S4 HANA is almost like a completely new evaluation and implementation. Yeah, it is. And, and, and it's interesting because S4 is looking for um, roles and responsibilities and, and people actually doing certain tasks, whereas previously that was blurred. It was anybody could do anything. You could limit the access that some people might have had to SAP, whereas now it's much more about the roles, processes and responsibilities. And so that's a whole different way of working for many organisations because I've never had that sort of uh, definition about who did what and, and restriction on how they go about and do it. So. so speaking of drama, since we are talking about the soap operas, we see a lot of very high profile SAP failures in news coverage. Do you still do you feel like SAP gets a bad rap on that? Um, as we don't see a lot of times as many ho- high profile failures by someone say on the same level like Oracle. Yeah, I think SAP deserves a bit of the the bad rap they get, and 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 I'm not being mean there. It's just the fact that I've got a great sales machine, and it makes makes it like we've just got to flick all these switches and and the lights are on and such. And and SAP's not like that. Um, and, and that's the problem is they sell a very easy solution when really it's probably the most complicated solution of all of the RPs I've ever worked with. So, so it's, um, if you've done SAP and done it well, you could roll out any other system, but not many get it right. And that's the challenge, I think, <laughs> that happens with, uh, with SAP implementations. So when you talk about kind of the, the need to define that phase zero planning for SAP implementation, what if you already have that legacy system? We just see so many clients, especially in those high profile cases that are looking at going from their legacy SAP system to S4 HANA or even going to an Oracle ERP opportunity, how do you ensure that you actually know what you're getting into in that evaluation phase and you have kind of that pre-work done? Well, it's an interesting uh, thing for many organisations is that understanding what you do and how much you actually use your current SAP system is, is what that readiness should actually look like. What's my data look like? How should that be? And I'll just share a little little bit of a story with you. We work with a, a large um, client uh, in, in Asia and, um, and they said, well, we've had SAP for the last 14 years. And so, uh, you know, we're really embedded with SAP. And so we actually did a process mining exercise to, for a particular section of their business. And we realized that they didn't actually use SAP. They actually used SAP for their financials and they used SAP to actually put numbers into, but no one actually outside of the back office actually used SAP. And so it, it was probably less than 5% of the business that is, actually was using SAP. And so you start going, well, should I actually put in SAP again or move, or should I put in something new because it's exactly the same thing? And so they actually opted to go to a completely new platform when they realized they actually don't use their SAP. And there's a lot of that happening for clients across the globe where really we don't use SAP in the way we have spreadsheets that feed information into SAP. We draw information out that's based on those spreadsheets that fed it in. Are we using SAP? Not really. And that's that's probably the challenge why many struggle to actually implement either a new platform or SAP again. Wow, that's really interesting. So not that we're going to, we gave your pre-work on process mining, so we won't go down the rabbit hole there. But how important are our initiatives like process mining or even maybe pre, pre-implementation pre audits to understanding those really critical requirements when looking at a large system like SAP S4 HANA? Yeah, well, we, we, we work with a, um, a gap, we call it a gap analysis. And so it's really understanding all of those areas. What's my data like? Where does my data come from? Do I use anything outside the system to feed my system? And so that readiness piece starts to understand how I actually use SAP, what are the processes I have in the business that I actually use that are are value processes, and are there any areas in the business that I find, you know, I've created bottlenecks as such. You know, authorization is always a good one. I might have, you know, I'm buying a paperclip and I need 20 people to sign off on that paperclip because it's spend of money. You know, those sorts of things are things that old SAP 
um, I suppose, uh, implementations have, have built up over time. And these days, we want to be able to streamline that and smooth that out. So, so the phase zero is a very important part because only then can you actually say, well, here's what I need to address prior to the SI or the solution integrator coming in to configure my new uh, SAP um, solution. If it's S4, it's S4. Um, and, and so there are those, those things that are vital. And, it, and it's interesting, some people say, how long does that take? For a large organization, that might take six months. And so am I prepared to actually wait six months to get my system in? Or am I prepared to actually not do that and then spend 12 months to two years extra than what I thought I could do to actually implement? And that's these failures uh, tend to happen and where we start to see them in the news. Absolutely. And that's such a good point. You know, that resourcing point that a lot of a lot of times our client partners do their due diligence, but there's so much conflicting kind of noise in the marketplace around what that should look like. You have kind of the, the vendor speak around it, which, of course, comes with a, a situational bias. And then you have, you know, consultant speak because you have a whole consultancy in SAP. And that kind of brings me to my next topic that I wanted to talk to you about, which was really that kind of the cast of characters when you look at an SAP implementation. And a lot of times we can see just chaos on that project team because there's so many different people involved. So who are some main characters in an SAP implementation? And can you describe their roles? Well, there's the, the program owner or sponsor, and I think that's that's one of those areas that, you know, they're like the conductor. And um, the problem is if you're not very good at conducting a, a full piece, you know, a hundred piece orchestra, which is essentially what an SAP implementation is, there's so many different moving moving parts, then then you start to get that chaos happen. And then, then we've got separate project managers that sit under under this program manager because we've got change, we've got data, we've got um, processes, we've got all those sort of project managers that we actually need to have covering and addressing those. And um, and so that makes it difficult because all of a sudden I need to have them all moving in sequence. I need to have them playing in time. I need to, I need to have things ready at a certain time so I can test that and check that. And, um, and all the time I'm, I'm asking the client or the customer or the organization to give me information as well, which isn't always readily available. And so it's it's a real a comedy of errors as such. It's it's very hard to have a, a um, you know, classical tune come out of a SAP implementation. It's more of, you know, um, uh, you know, a whole lot of people playing individual songs. And that's that's the problem with the characters, characters we have. And so whether it's a sponsor, whether it's a project manager, whether it's it's people within their leads and analysts and those sort of people, they all need to play their part, but they don't always know what the tune is. And that's the difficulty. Yeah, that harmony, right, that you need in a healthy project. Absolutely. We're here with Wayne and Kyler talking about the soap opera of SAP implementations and some of the lessons learned and things you can do to, to learn from these common pitfalls and risks to make your SAP ERP implementations more successful. We've got a lot more to cover, but we'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, Contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 146. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham and Wayne Holtham talking about SAP implementations and some of the lessons behind, common lessons behind SAP implementations, as well as what you can do to make your SAP or ERP implementation more successful. We've got a lot more to cover, so let's jump back into the conversation. When you look at teams, you had mentioned one of our clients that have had SAP for 14 years. And honestly, that's kind of a short time to have SAP. There's many people that have had them 
had them as a legacy system for a very long time. So can you talk about a project team biases when it comes to SAP and how that might lead to implementation challenges? Yeah, and it's it's interesting because when you've had um, uh, when you've when you've got some SIs that are very focused on um, on SAP and they are used of the old SAP where I can get into the back end, write code, change code, customize that code, they have this view that we can make anything happen for you. But with that comes that extra complication of you know trying to be able to test, trying to be able to get it so it actually works together. And so the bias ends up being where the SI is so fixed on, I can make it do what you want because that's what I always did. But it ends up being a dichotomy in the sense that um, SAP don't want you to do that. And so, so it's that challenge they have where they're saying, well, we don't want you to change our code. We want you to actually stay to standard, stay to best practice. And so um, that's that's often the, the challenge when you've got you know seasoned SAP SIs that are used to doing it the old way because that's where they drive their dollars, I suppose. That's their billable hours is the more I do in customization, the more I make changes, the more the implementation costs. And so for them, that's a value driver for them. Um, for the organization, now the innocent person sitting there going, well, I just want what I want and, you know, show me it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's often hard not to be able to, to, be able to see what, they've, uh, what they're actually getting, so... Absolutely, especially in a system so complex. You know, you would need a year-long demo to see, you know, all of the functionalities that you you really have in that. So this might be a kind of a hard question, but there's there's so many different SAP specific consultants or someone that might have a financial relationship with SAP. So when you're looking at those consultants, are they the villain? in the SAP drama or who would you say the villain is when it comes to SAP drama implementations? I, I would, I, well, there's, there's, there's probably various levels of villains. And so the salesperson's the biggest villain in my mind is because they come in and they sell a dream and we all love to have a dream, don't we? But then all of a sudden we go, well, uh, can I realize that dream? And then the SI comes in and goes, well, I can help you, you know, I'm here, I'll be able to sort this out for you. And and so that there's, there's two villains there as such in the sense that one is that I get a uh, an everlasting uh, stream of money coming in because I bought licenses from SAP or bought access and that's the sales people. And then I look at the SIs who have got this, well, we can do anything you want. The longer we're here and the more people we have, your system will be great. And then when it doesn't work out that way, it's all of a sudden, well, you signed off on that. So thank you, Mr. Client. And that's where the that's where the challenge is. So there's there's two probably main villains as such. Um, but I don't think the the client gets off free in that in the sense that you know if they really don't know what they want, they can let one of these projects go way out of control before they actually really realise that it's way out of control. And I think that's the that's the that's the other part, and that's the 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 person who's being you know um, shadowed with all of this uh, this wonderment of uh, of the dream that they purchased but but now it's not actually turning out that way. That's incredible. That's definitely um, a, a lot to manage. So as of you know, obviously SAP targets large, complex, likely global organizations. So you have a lot under you. But if you are a, a project manager, really with any system, how do you ensure that you keep ownership? over those strategic goals that you want to achieve as a business as opposed to getting you know enchanted um, by some of some of this this really powerful sales jargon from both your SI and your vendor who are supposed to be trusted partners yeah that's right and I, th I think that one of the things that the business the organization itself has to take control and so okay understand how do we operate what do we want to operate and when we're looking at demonstrations, can you show me how your system would do that? And all of a sudden you start to get that, that ownership that actually controls then what's happening. And so all of a sudden you get that view of here's what I need to happen. And so can you make that happen for me? Whereas if we leave it up to the, to the SI, they don't know your business really. And so they often look at other businesses they've worked with or just their own general view of life and and we'll we'll craft something that actually suits what they need not necessarily what the business needs and uh, and when you get that situation that's where you get that the users don't like using it 
they want to go back to their spreadsheets, um, you know, and failure starts to be the word that uh, is on everyone's lips. Absolutely. So rounding out kind of our, our cast of characters and how to kind of manage to them, what does your team do when it comes to a large SAP, either implementation, restoration, selection project? What does, what's your role in that? So, so it's interesting. We, we, um, we, we help build the operating model. So how's the business want to operate in this new environment? So that's one of the things we do. The second thing we do is understand, we do the gap analysis. So how do you operate today? So instead of doing a lot of as is mapping and all of that sort of thing, we actually go out on site and we actually look at how people actually do what they do. So if I'm going to produce a widget, I'm going to do something, what information am I sourcing to actually produce that and supply that sort of thing? And so we get a picture of what that looks like. And then we understand what's the new system looking for. And so that's that gap. And so we work on some readiness projects then that allow us to be able to close that gap. And so if we, people aren't using the system, the aim is to drive them back to using the system as such because it makes sense to use the system, not just because it's a system that's a new one. And and so that's that's the sort of work we do. And then with the SI, it's about defining those, what we call deliverables. Um, and so the deliverables are my data. So have I got good data? What am I going to do to actually clean that up, create that, build that? Um, so when the SI comes in, they have a very clear plan of approach. Their discovery can be quite short, six weeks is what they typically have, um, because all of the answers have already been provided. And so they can actually say, I have an answer to this question, this question, this question, and then I can go off and design and build. And so whereas what you usually find is they come in and they go, oh, I don't have an answer for that. I don't have an answer for that. Okay, we need to go off and build this. And that's where we start losing control of our project. And when do you see kind of to to go from the cast of characters to kind of, you know, the the plot twist, if you will, we see headlines around SAP failures that are in the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. So how did those go so incredibly wrong? And at what point, I'm sure there were a variety of points, but is there a some point that those red flags start to fly when it comes to what's going on with our project and how do we ensure we, we need to course correct now? Yeah, that, that, it's, it's an interesting you say because I've, I've been involved in some expert witness cases and I've also been involved in projects that you know, some have gone six years and uh, still not gone live. And so, so so that's staggering to think, how come someone hasn't pulled this up earlier? Um, but it is that thing of the, 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 the understanding of governance and assurance. It's making sure that you have actually completed all of that pre-works before you start doing design and those sorts of other things. Because if you're designing something and you don't have all of the information, the challenge is what are you designing? And that's where the cost blows out and there's course corrections constantly happening uh, over that time. And all of a sudden you start to go, well, should I be course correcting this? Or is it something that, you know, we need to actually really look at the whole project and actually reset fully. Whereas we sort of course correct little bits and we don't actually address the overall issue. And that's why it just keeps blowing out. So, and the SI is quite happy to be able to help help in the sense that they just get billable hours, we bring another another team in and, you know, it's all good. And uh, But you as the client or the organisation, you're paying the bills and that's where the, the problem is. And so there's not the deterrent for the SI because they go, well, you know, you signed off on this previous design. So, oh, well, we'll fix it for you now. And, and obviously there comes a cost comes with that. Absolutely. And and so when we look at kind of how those failures happen to kind of unwind that, looking at kind of the chapters or the different acts in this soap opera drama, when we look at integrations or something like being able to utilize SAP as your core function, but say you need a different application or a bolt-on for some sort of competitive advantage, SAP has been notorious around not integrating well or not playing well with others. What are some things that you can do to ensure that you have that interoperability strategy fully baked before you pick a system and invest so much dollars or you know any sort of currency in this specific new technology if you're not sure if it will work across your other technology stack? That's interesting you uh, uh, question, Kyla, because 
from from my perspective, it's about looking at the functional architecture. You know, there's solution architecture many people talk about or enterprise architecture. The functional architecture says, well, if I've got a, a CRM system that's not, say, SAP, and I've got SAP in the middle and I've got some other systems there, how am I going to get going to get them all to talk? And so integration is the often the, the way to do that. But if I'm starting to look at it and say, well, I'm, I'm taking information uh, from that system and I need to reinterpret it into SAP, that's a very complex integration. And so that's where you find the complexity starts to happen in the sense that I need really detailed, you know, rule-based integrations that actually are sending my information, turning it into something else, and then putting it into SAP to understand. And then I've got to send it back to that system when, it, when something's changed. And so, so that's often the problem is that we don't really understand how we want that flow of information to go from one system to the other. We just bolt things on. And, you know, sometimes when you bolt it on, it doesn't line up. And so all of a sudden we have to write very, very complex information flows, which is integrations, to be able to make that happen. And so that's, that's the problem. Um, old SAP was a lot harder to actually integrate. It was more of a standalone platform. Today it's a little bit easier, but still you need to understand what you want to flow, where you want to flow, and how much change of that flow needs to happen in the course of the integration. And I, I tell this story to everyone because I still feel like I'm shocked to this day to hear it. But we, we recently had a client that came to us looking for help with their SAP implementation because they built that customized integration with their SI and then did not realize that their SI actually owned it. They they own the impl intellectual property, excuse me, around building that customized integration. So is is that something that that you see a lot with your, you know, bigger global clients when it comes to kind of what you talked about? Should you customize to not customize? You know, the balance between where does business process meet the technology? Yeah, and that's often a problem because I get the SI in and I get them to customize or create uh, specialized integrations and all of a sudden that custom code is theirs. It's it's something that you know, it's often written, there isn't a step-by-step uh, -step rule book on how it's done. It's usually left up to the consultant to write that. And so then if I bring another consultant in, they'll look at it and go, oh, no, that's not right. And so, or I can't work on that because I don't, you know, it's not, not our code. And that's a challenge that organizations um, don't often understand until they've either changed their size or, or they've got some problems with the code and they lose face. And, and so they want to actually get someone else in to look at it. And it's, it's specialized code. And that's the difficulty with, um, with SAP. You know, these days there's a lot more already packaged, uh, integrations with our plug and play. They are much, much simpler to be able to have in, in, uh, so you can, so anybody can work on those. They're standard code, um, follow standard protocols. And so, but S, not all SAP SIs do it that way. Yeah. Absolutely. It's it's always just sometimes you you get to see kind of the industry pivoting to more transparency. And then you hear a story like that and you're like, what in the world is happening? Um, but it, I mean, it's it's obviously very prevalent. And that's why, you know, the the steps of, you know, understanding that phase zero planning, understanding your requirements, that contracting phase is is so critical, as you outlined earlier. We're here with Wayne and Kyler talking about the soap opera of SAP implementations and some of the lessons learned and things you can do to, to learn from these common pitfalls and risks to make your SAP ERP implementations more successful. We've got a lot more to cover, but we'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. Hi, my name is Eric Kimberling. I'm your host here on Transformation Ground Control. And if you haven't already, I want to invite you to buy my new book. It's called The Final Countdown, Strategies to Reach the Third Stage of Digital Transformation. It's my first book. I'm very proud of it. I love this book. And it, it was my attempt to create a summary and a playbook for what it takes to be successful in defining a digital strategy and a roadmap for your organization. So there's a lot of things we can cover when we talk about digital transformation. We talk about a lot of stuff on this show, but I wanted to condense it into a readable sort of a sequential format that made it easy to help define a digital strategy for project teams that is unique to your organization, unique to your goals and objectives. So really uh, hope you'll you'll read it. I hope you enjoy it. Again, it's called The Final Countdown. You can read that book by scanning the QR code right here in front of you, or you can go to thefinalcountdown.com. 
Um, again, it's it's been an Amazon bestseller since it came out, so I encourage uh, you to check it out and love to hear your views and your comments on it too. So The Final Countdown, my new book, you can go to thefinalcountdown.com or scan the QR code in front of you. Hope you enjoy, and we'll see you soon. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 146. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham and Wayne Holtham talking about SAP implementations and some of the lessons behind, common lessons behind SAP implementations, as well as what you can do to make your SAP or ERP implementation more successful. We've got a lot more to cover, so let's jump back into the conversation. I want to talk about kind of the new season of SAP, if you will. So what does, as we come right now, when we're talking, having this conversation, it's late 2023. So what does 2024 really look like for SAP implementations? They've had a rough couple of years when it comes to just overall perspective, um, just, you know, failures all over the place. What do you think that 2024 is going to look like? Is it going to be something that they actually kind of revamp that? I know for us at Third Stage, we've gotten a lot more strategic alliances at SAP interested in kind of working with our independents. So it seems from our end, there is some shift in wanting to create that change. And then also, I'll also ask you as a part of this question about the new SAP mid-market push as well, trying to meet kind of NetSuite where it is or other kind of mid-market manufacturing areas. They've seemed to really kind of bolt onto that space in the last couple months too. So what does the future look like with your crystal ball, Wayne, for SAP? (laughs) I think it's interesting because SAP is coming from a place that... um, of where they have a good market market share as such, and and a lot of people have SAP. Moving forward, the challenge they've had is getting people to want to actually go to a new SAP. They've 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 sort of identified that we're not going to support it any longer, and they've bought out new solutions. And but what they're finding is that new SAP is not old SAP, and so it's not a complete transition. So for them, they've offered new packages of. Uh, SaaS and uh, so you know so subscription as a service type uh, SAP where we've got a custom set up or not a, or a standard set up that's a multi-tenant um, that we can actually have people all join just like uh, other um, software vendors have done but they're using the old way of of constructing that in the background the back code and so it's not as still as flexible as some of the more you know uh, systems that have been built built to suit um, multi-tenant. And um, and so for them, it's going to be a bit of a challenge and they're pushing into, you know, the, the risk they've got is the big players aren't moving because they're not sure what they should go to and they see a lot of risk in it. So how do you make sales? You go to a different market. And so the mid sales is where they're starting to push now because they see that as probably a less complicated um, area of the business or area of the market. And, um, and so, that that keeps sales generating because they're not getting the sales from the the larger players. You know, there's there's some SAP implementations that have actually been stalled, been halted because you know they're too too complicated as such. And so, you know, with probably still seventy uh, percent of SAP um, current ECC six um, customers still waiting to move to something else, and we've got the deadline looming of twenty. 27, I think it is, which is coming on pretty fast. Um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a huge bottleneck that, that has to happen. Someone's got to change and shift somewhere. And SAP is, I think, needs to probably think a little bit more about how they ready their clients to actually feel comfortable that they are okay to make that move. And I don't think selling a shiny, bright system um, is quite enough yet to actually... Um, to uh, to overcome that that risk that organizations see. Yeah. Do you have the um, very grouchy ladybug children's book in Australia? Yes, yes. Yeah, by Eric Carl. So that reminds me of the very grouchy ladybug because the preface of the book is this very grouchy ladybug goes and sees all this different animals and it says, oh, you're not big enough to fight with me because it's a very grouchy ladybug. And it kind of reminds me of SAP because in the end, it decides that it actually is humble enough 
to fight with these different animals over the aphids on the leaf. And now here we see SAP kind of go back to businesses that they've historically said, oh, you're not big enough for us um, type of thing. And they've tried to kind of revamp that. So we'll have to kind of see how how that goes, because it's a you know, it's a very interesting strategic decision. But of course, SAP is a great system. It, it might make sense for some mid market businesses. Well, it does make sense. And, and you know, there's a lot of pressure to think, well, uh, SAP has been around for a long time. It's a great product. And there are some um, some implementations that have got a great result. So we can't always say they are bad. But if you look at the pathway they, they uh, took to actually get that great result, they did a lot of thinking first. They understood their business and SAP was able to satisfy that result for them. The gap is if we don't understand, we want a shortcut, we want to actually do things really, really quickly then we end up with this, I've got something that it doesn't want to play the same tune as I have. And so, and that's the difficulty that uh, SAP faces moving forward. And you look at a lot of the global players that have SAP today, they've customized it so it works really, really well. So what am I going to go to now if I can't have customizations or a level of functionality that I've, I've become accustomed to? And so, you know, a lot of the large miners and those sort of people have very mature SAP instances. Do I want to change? <laughs> what am I going to? You know, these are some of the things that, that are on organizations' minds, you know, and uh, and so how do I, what, what's better out there than what I have today since I've actually made it really work for me and my people actually use it. And so so that's some of the challenges that, um, that the organizations face. Yeah. And it's always great to have partners like you and your team too, because sometimes when we come in and do an evaluation like that or a current state assessment, like you mentioned, we say, you know, actually there's just some tweaks in your operations or your business processes that you can make because we don't have those financial relationships with selling you any additional system. So that's not our priority. Our priority is to make sure that the technology is working for your organization. That's right. And and often it's like you, you're doing those tweaks that actually drive that value as against saying, well, let's throw out that system because it doesn't work. Um, and, that, and that's often a benefit as well, I think, for organisations because they can actually then start to understand the business a bit better, knowing the system they have. And they don't have that complexity of I've got to change the system. I've got to get better at what I do. And there's a lot of work in all of that. And so um, so sometimes even before you're looking at putting a new system in, Getting that assessment and understanding, you know, what do I do? What would it need? What would it take? How could I improve? Those sorts of things are really, really valuable because if you get that right, the implementation becomes a whole lot easier to actually deliver. Absolutely. So ending on a high note, let's go into some happily ever afters, because as you mentioned, it's not always that SAP implementations fail. Sometimes SAP implementations go really well. Can you give us some examples of what that might look like for um, businesses that have kind of thrived on an SAP implementation? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Um... Uh, in there's a, a utility client that I, that I know of here in Australia, and and uh, they actually put in SAP, and uh, and they actually got it to the point that it was so functional that they could do every aspect of their business through SAP, and so all of the users actually used SAP. All the reports that were created, they may have done some custom reports, which is standard for SAP, but custom using the data out of SAP. Um, and so that's a really good outcome because all of a sudden I'm using the system completely. And then recently in S4, similar type thing where I, I built the, uh, the business around the roles, responsibilities. I made it uh, functional so people could actually put information in from the field. I was getting information into, this, into the system. And so I'm able to use system, the system to make decisions. And that's a really great outcome. And SAP can make that happen if you actually approach it the right way. And so uh, that functional architecture is a big piece to that. How do I get my information in? How do I use that information? And am I using the system? And I think that's that's for every system, but SAP in particular. If you're not using SAP as the system of choice and your preference is a spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet, and feeding information in, then you're not really using SAP. And I think that's a lot of organizations, that's the first tick on the box, how many spreadsheets do you actually have? Uh, we'll give you a view of how much you're actually using your SAP. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and as you mentioned earlier, that's so important on the other side of that too. Maybe you are using the system and there's just a few, you know, recommendations that you can put in as far as different behaviors to ensure you're optimizing or reaching the overall potential of the system that you do have. And it can be a happy ending. Oh, it can be. And if it's if the users are using it and they find it easy to use, it's really, really good to actually um, see see the value SAP can have. You know, the new Fiori that SAP has, the user interface, isn't all of those crazy transactions that um, most people talk. I think I think one of the things you talk about SAP lingo. So we could talk about you know IW twenty nine and IW thirty uh, six and all of those sort of things. That's all the lingo that you talk to the old world of SAP. But the new world, it's about what am I doing? What's the task I'm doing? I'm going to pay an account. And so that's a lot more usable if you get people using the system and the information's in there. And so so that's the difference, I think, that um, from old to new is uh, the way people interact with it and the interface they actually have. Very good. Well, this has been an unbelievably great conversation. So thank you for sharing your insight. Any final thoughts on you want to share around SAP implementations just in general? Uh, I, th I think that people, sh <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting with, uh, we've, we've got a client at the moment that's looking at, uh, they've been sold a global template for SAP and, uh, and where they've rolled it out in, in a couple of their global instances, they've realized that the global template doesn't actually fit for their business. So they've had to make a lot of modifications. And so, so it's about saying, stepping back and saying, well, what do I really need? and looking at it from that perspective. And then if they understand that SAP can be a really great option for them, but without doing that and listening to the fact that, well, we've got this, this out of the box model, just unpack it out and look, we've constructed it and it'll be fine. doesn't suit everybody. And I think that's the challenge that people are facing is, um, you know, believing that, you know, one size fits all, um, you know, and you should be able to, I'm not saying customization here, I'm saying configuration and adapt your business to it being more consistent in the way it operates is the other part to that is not just saying, not blaming software completely. It's you as an organization, how can you be a bit more consistent in what you do? So uh, there's, and, and there's lots of instances where we have really complicated back office processes that we don't need. So. Most, most definitely, you have to have, you know, the right system that fits your requirements, but you also have, have to have healthy business practices, good data hygiene to ensure that they can work together in that harmonious, great analogy you gave about the symphony. I love that. If you don't mind it, I'm going to steal it. As moving forward. So. <laughs> but if you'd like to learn more about SAP, we do actually have, I'll pop it up on the screen here, or you can get it in the description if you are um, consuming this on an audio um, platform. Our, our guide to SAP S4 HANA. And this is a 60 plus page playbook that really gives you kind of step by step of how to ensure that you are doing effective phase zero planning, that you have the implementation resources, understand that, and that you are optimizing via user adoption and other strategies as well. So I highly recommend that. Um, and if you do want to reach out to Wayne, you can um, reach out to him at firstname.lastname at thirdstage-consulting.com, or he is available in our team section on our website. So thank you so much again, Wayne. It was so great to talk to you as always. And we will see you next time. Okay. Thank you, Wayne and Kyler. Great conversation, great stuff, and, and some really good uh, takeaways from that conversation as far as some of the plot twists that you commonly see during a SAP or ERP implementation, some of the cliffhangers, some interesting characters that, that you guys unpacked there, I thought was super, super interesting. Um, and it was also interesting to talk about, you know, how to declare victory and, and how to look forward uh, once you have implemented uh, SAP or any other sort of ERP project as well. So great stuff. Really appreciate uh, that conversation and curious to hear what the audience thinks here. What, what have you seen work with your SAP or ERP implementation? What are some of those common challenges and what are some of those plot twists that you uh, have had to navigate as part of your digital transformation? I'd love to hear your comments uh, below as well. And maybe that's something we could we can unpack in a future episode. So be sure to, to leave your comment here for consideration in a, in a future episode uh, discussion as well. So I want to thank everyone for being a part of this podcast here today. Thank you to our guests and thank you to the audience for the great questions and contributions. Uh, again, this show comes out every Wednesday. You can find new episodes and past episodes by going to transformationgroundcontrol.com. Uh, this podcast is sponsored by Third Stage Consulting, which is an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world reach the third stage of digital transformation success 
and it is produced by Major Tom Productions, which pr provides uh, media content and event production for business to business technology providers. So be sure to uh, reach out at majortom-productions.com if you'd like to learn more about brand awareness and sponsorship opportunities. Again, that's majortom-productions.com. And uh, I've included my contact information below if you'd like to reach out to me to suggest ideas for, for this podcast and be sure to uh, share any ideas you might have. I always love to uh, hear what the audience wants to hear, of course. So love to hear from you. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of this podcast. We'll see you next week on Transformation Ground Control. Have a great week in the meantime, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.